if you saw one of the last PISA reports that has a correlation between time spent playing games, video games in general, and the proficiency in the test. And it's a, like a bell-shaped cur curve like this. So if you play too much, you do badly. If you play too little, also. So what, what's your take in that? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. So there are some of my colleagues that are looking at um, gaming experts, so people that compete and in fact live off gaming because they are like major players on um, different types of action video games or like role playing games or mobile and looking at their skills. It seems that it's not a U-shaped function. Like they, for example, in terms of numbers of object of attention, they can track nine when a normal human being can track four. Um, so it keeps going, but you have to understand that it's something very different from what we typically have done, meaning that these people don't play the same game over and over again. It keeps changing. And I think that's a key point about gaming, is gaming is extremely rich because you play against other human beings. And so the trajectory of gaming is never predictable. You never know what new challenges, what new kind of social skills you may need. It's a very, very complex environment. That complexity is exciting. It's extremely hard to study. Hello. Uh, I, mean, I want to learn about, uh, for everybody, uh, the people they in school have a long time to learn to write. How long time you, you need to dedicate in write, in, in teach write, in, in not take this time to just digit, not writing? You think about that? It, because it's so long time to teach for the children to write the right letter, the right the, the word, and everybody just digit, not write more. Just talk about that. So I am no expert in that, but I can tell you a few ideas out there. So you're right, kids um, tend to interact with devices rather than now taking a pencil and a piece of paper. You have actually great YouTube videos where you see like one year and a half being very frustrated as interacting with a piece of paper and trying to slide their finger around it. Um, there are a number of people beginning to study how the use of tablet is affecting very fine motor control. And so what's interesting is that it actually leads to development of fine motor control very early on, it seems, because now we have one year and a half, at least in the US, very, very young children, almost preverbal children, are picking up a tablet or phone device and interacting with it through rather fine motor control. What we don't know is whether the fine motor control that is needed of tablet, which is relatively limited because it's pointing at the right location, is going to be as rich as what you need to do for writing, where we're really tracing full trajectories that um, are much more complex. In technology, like I have colleagues at the PFL that are like designing actually a little robot that teaches kids to write where the kids needs to actually teach the robot how to write and so you, the kids actually writes on the tablet and the kids that are all sort of right now it's an experimentation that is on kids that have motor uh, delay the kids love it because it's something new and also they fail with a robot but they don't fail in front of adults and so there are ways in which we may be able especially for rehabilitation of children to be able to use technology but in general, as mass practice in the classroom, it's not clear that we want to give up on writing, which is a very rich way of training very fine motor control and the kind of skills that um, some of you talked about here, which is synchronization of action and timing. Hello. Hi, my question is to Stemper. Uh, no. John. Yeah. John. Uh, David. David. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, just temper from Carnegie Mellon. Oh, yeah. oh. Okay, my question is about research and innovation, because you are doing a wonderful work at the university, but at the same time you are working with companies and you have a company. So, uh, at least in Brazil, it's quite complex to deal with the time to market and the time to research, because it's really different. So, how is the process between 
the research you are doing and the innovation that you are applying to the company. So, this on? This red light. Yes, it is. Okay. Now it's on. All right. Can you hear me? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, so, one of the reasons I am really interested in working with industry and, and, and one of the reasons I started the company is that this technology has really been languishing out there for about 20 years and it hasn't become ubiquitous. It's not in it. Why isn't this adaptive technology in every single educational technology product? We know it's significantly better. Um, <clears throat> and the reason is it's really hard to do. Um, and um, the Carnegie Learning Company that spun out of, uh, out of Carnegie Mellon has been really successful, but um, they have no competition, so they have no incentive to improve their product. Um, uh, they are the adaptive cognitive tutor, and they are the intelligent tutor that's out there. So um, I, I think it's hugely important that, these, that the research does get into industry and does get put into the actual products. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it is a slow thing, um, and there is a lot of marketing uh, stuff that goes on that, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of uh, adaptive learning companies that are out there that aren't doing anything adaptive. Um, so it's, it, it's really a tough struggle, and uh, yeah, it, it's been a fine, uh, a fine line for me to try to figure out how to make it happen. And, you know, quite honestly, one of the reasons I did the company was is not to make a lot of money, it's to get this technology out and help people make their existing products adaptive. Hello, my question is about video games. And uh, I'm wondering that normally boys used to use his visual sketchpad on working memory more easily than girls. So um, I'm curious about if you have tested the video games with girls and if, sh if they exhibited some improvement in the same systems? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Um, so this, oops. the study that actually I mentioned with the mental rotation found initially um, that uh, girls improved more uh, than boys. But in fact, when you play action video game, but in fact, it's not that they improve more, that they have more room to improve. So if you take girls that are equated at the beginning in terms of skills with boys, everybody improved by the same amount. But because girls start with that little behind performance, then they show greater improvement. One of the main worry, and I think David shares that, is that we are in a world where by default, by choice, boys are going to choose technology that actually boost their visual spatial skills, and girls are going to choose technology that actually boosts their social skills. They want to be where they are good at, but the issue is we need to force them <laughs> to sort of cross. And so by choosing where they're good at, they're actually reinforcing those differences. And it, it's a real bias you can see. Like in video games, we know that all of the video games that tends to rely on visual spatial skills are dominantly used by male. And all the social games, the games that are like about um, communication and relationship are dominantly used by female. Whether it's actually 40 years old female or like 12 years old female. So it, we have that choice preference that we have to worry about. And really the challenge, and one of the challenge actually of the NSF funded program that we got was to think about how to make an action video game that would be actually palatable to girls de conduta, né? Crianças e adolescentes ou, ou né? enfim, é, porque já tem um, um comportamento, né? É, agressivo, antissocial. Se isso não iria é, fazer com que elas ficassem mais agressivas ou antissociais? Tem algum estudo que faça restrição a essas crianças ou como é que ou não? Is somebody able to translate? Because this is coming in Portuguese, so it's not going to help me. <laughs> But maybe you can press the button. I'm sorry. That makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, repeat. <laughs> sorry. 
Bem, se, no caso com as crianças, okay. é, nos vídeos voltados, no caso, para ação, né, que tem algumas cenas de violência, com relação às crianças e adolescentes que apresentam o transtorno de conduta, né, antissocial, comportamento agressivo, se isso não vem agravar mais essa, essa, esse comportamento, né, é, visto que tem vários estudos né, que falam sobre a questão pré-frontal, né, com relação ao comportamento inibitório, enfim. Vamos, vou tentar mais para esses detalhes. E se tem alguma restrição? Né? Porque eu fico imaginando essas crianças vendo esses, esses, esses vídeos, né? se elas não ficariam mais agressivas, se tariam, é, colocariam esse comportamento no ambiente, ou em casa, ou na escola. Tem algum estudo sobre isso? Ok, so your question is about the fact that um, most, if not all, of action games happen to be violent. And so you're worried about what does the violence do? Do we need actually the violence? Is the violence going to increase aggression? So there's two different uh, answer. The first one is that um, there are many violent games out there that are not action video games and they don't have the same effect. So we know that violence on its own is actually not sufficient. What we don't know is whether it's necessary. So again, the NSF game that we're working on is a game that is like thought for girls and without violence, but with the game mechanics of an action video game. It's an empirical question. If you ask me, I can't tell you yes or no whether we need the violence to get the effects, but we know that the violence by itself won't do it. Now, the other question was more about the fact that the more general literature on video games and violence and what are we doing to our kids when we're exposing them to those kind of violence. And that you're right, there's a very rich literature showing that if you play 10 minutes, 15 minutes of a violent media, or if you watch actually 10, 15 minutes of violent movie, even you, are going to tend to be then more aggressive physically, cognitively, and emotionally toward others for the next five minutes. And this has been replicated over and over again. And so you see that in your children because you get your children, right? Like they are all charged up, they have played something violent, and you see them being more aggressive. The big question in literature, and something which is very hotly debated, is whether those short bouts that <clears throat> then disappear, like you don't see the effect of aggression after 15 minutes, it totally disappears, but whether those short period lead to a change in violent behavior in the long run. That is, do you change the personality of the person, does the person become more aggressive? And here I would say the jury is entirely out. We're talking to these people because we're actually able to do training studies with violent video games because we predict positive outcome. But they can't do it because it's actually unethical to say we're going to take people and we're going to render them more violent. So there is a lot of discussion. Part of the issue and the complication is that the effect of the, um, that I showed you We need about 15 subjects in each group to see robust effect, robust changes. In the literature on violence, the effects are small. We would need about 100 subjects per group to see the effects. And that becomes a problem of cost and time. So we're actually thinking of how to do these studies, which are intervention studies, across many different labs, labs in Europe, labs in Latin America. <laughs> we, need, we need lots of labs to come together. Um, and we like, really need to do the same kind of studies as we have been able to do, which is intervention studies, take people, we won't do them on children, we'll do them on adults, but take people and ask that question in earnest. But for now, this has never been done. So the question about the long-term impact is not known. Now, don't take me wrong, I'm not advocating for letting especially young children play violent games. Uh, I think there is really <clears throat> an issue with thinking through um, what you expose your children to and talking to them. It's amazing to me how many parents think, I'll put the kid on technology, this is a great nanny. Your technology is not a nanny. <laughs> your technology is actually, means that your kids is interacting with a different world. You need to understand what they are doing. And so that's a role of a parent to actually talk to the children and establish a link. You will learn a lot of things. And actually, there are some great games out there. And they will learn a lot of things. They will teach you a lot of things. Um, and you can even sort of really boost the relationship with the kid. But the parents need to be fully engaged. I agree with you. And that's a total order. I'll come back to the question that uh, my previous. Uh, 
I have uh, uh, three comments on violent video games. I think that the data is very robust about uh, uh, increasing aggression and especially what I, I'm very concerned is that together with increasing aggression, it decreases uh, pro-social behavior and empathy, which is, I think, a basic educational uh, tool that we should uh, improve. And second, there is a, a, a work on presenting positive stuff or negative stuff and testing attention. And negative stuff, is, uh, stuff focus attention, this is well shown. And positive uh, uh, stuff seems to be, uh, let the person more distractible. And this was, uh, but recently, this uh, was really shown that uh, you, increase uh, creativity, we increase problem solving. So it's very important that uh, to, to learning that people uh, are aware and open to, to, to different uh, uh, things that are occurring. So I think that, and the third, we have uh, been testing uh, defensive behavior, uh, human defensive behavior in the lab and, uh, and we decided in the last study to ask the question to see if our volunteers uh, usually play violent games and we have to exclude them because their behavior was very inappropriate in a defensive set compared to the group that didn't play at, at all or play very uh, unfrequently. So I think that if there is this uh, question that uh, I think the, the, the bad things about playing viol, viol, violent games uh, surpasses uh, the visual uh, improvement. And, and as you comment that uh, you don't know if the violence is uh, important or not, so I think we should, I uh, really would... Uh, ask people to not to use them. Because I think if it's not, uh, even, even if it was relevant, I wouldn't use it. So I think it's a big concern about uh, showing, uh, playing violence, uh, making people uh, behave in a very violent uh, set. No, thank you for your comment. It's an area which I began to work in four years ago, so actually um, partly between the University of Geneva and Rochester. Um, in Geneva, there is a very strong group in, uh, and center for emotion and affective sciences. So I've begun to do some of that work. Um, and so you're right, there is a very clear pattern that if you play for 10 minutes, if you watch a violent movie for 10 minutes, you are going to be more aggressive for the next five minutes. These effects are very short. That, these, uh, the data are there, like, you know, it's been done by Anderson, it's been done by Doug Gentile. This, this, they don't know, they don't, they don't last. So the issue, and then you have the effects, you have only cross-sectional studies or longitudinal studies about the long-term effects. And some of these issues are really questions of where is the chicken and where is the egg. It's a question of causality. And unless we do a training study, we can't solve that causality. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not right or it's not true. Yeah, I'm not telling you, I'm telling you we don't Probably. know. I'm telling you we don't know. That's what I told the, we don't know about the long-term effect. I don't think we need to, to, to make an experiment for that. So if it's not uh, relevant, if it has bad uh, outcomes in other uh, uh, behavioral and important motivational set, so why should we uh, even test it? Well, I think we need to test it both ways, actually. What we're doing in the lab right. is testing it because we want long-term effect, as you were saying, for empathy and pro-social. We know these are very yoked mechanisms. So what we're testing, actually, in our case, is testing 
the fact that we can also get positive effects. So we're testing both. Is it true that you're going to get long-term, sustainable positive effect in empathy and pro-social by playing a pro-social games repeatedly for 50 hours? We don't know that answer either. And if we find this is true, we'll have actually now like you know ground values to keep working on how to think about putting what we want in video games and removing what we don't want. Like the, the real the, the the goal is to also advise about best practices in the kind of video games that are released. So for education, I would agree with you, like the kind of entertainment video game that the industry is releasing, like action-packed video games that have violence are not relevant for education right now. But if we understand what are the components that actually facilitate the learning, then we can embed them into the educational setting. And if we understand how to promote um, behavior that is pro-social or emp empathy, then we can also act there. So these are all very basic questions. There's much, much, much we don't know. I think you're giving too much credit to a literature which is just starting. There's a lot we still don't know, and especially in terms of changing emotional and aggressive behavior in the long term or pro-social behavior in the long term. There is very, very much work to be done. I think this is an excellent issue to be discussed over lunchtime. Now let's move on to the next. Yeah. My, my question is for Nancy, and, but it applies for, I think, all if you want. Uh, a common factor in all the, the speech is that we are trying to discover things from the data from the students, but we are not uh, intentionally asking students. And we know from other approaches that self-assessment is very important. And my question is, what could we have if we ask the students to provide evidence of the way, for instance, if they are using uh, uh, spatial language with this or that quality, and they provide, they mark, this is an evidence that I'm doing this in, with this quality. Or if they are using thinking routines or heuristics or strategies, they say, I'm using this or that, but we can follow the path. Or, in your case, when you have the design, you have the, the discussion, and they can uh, again provide evidence that I'm doing the discussion with this or that quality. For that, we need to provide a, a, a framework for them to, to evaluate quality, but then they can mark themselves. And uh, my question is, why are we not using the student data inside the designs that we all are using? Um, thank you for the question, and it's, um, <clears throat> so I totally agree with you that it is very important for the students to, I mean, as I said, the learning design studio, the focus is on the learner's experiences, and also the evidence that we can get from the learner's behavior and the work that they do to f reflect on what they have actually gained. And so um, one of the things that um, that we're trying to look at is, say, if we say the learning type. So one of the learning type which is missing, and we actually need to change the program because, say, the history um, course actually wants the students to provide evidence-based um, sort of argument in the, in the uh, debates that they're going to do with, um, you know, with each other, they're working in groups. And so, so, um, so they need to be doing the debate, and they also need to be then um, peer assess each other on uh, how good the evidence is. And so, um, so what we would like to be able to do is in fact to capture the different kinds of um, pedagogical design that would allow us to say, first of all, say, for example, you would highlight the goal is to get the students to provide evidence-based um, arguments for, say, some of their views. So if this is the goal, what kind of um, learning activities would allow this goal to be achieved, and what kind of evidence can you look for? Say, if this is an online thing, then say the data that we can capture, perhaps we can actually use this course analysis to detect, you know, um, words that would indicate evidence and argument and so on. Yeah. I'll add. I'll add that there, there has been a lot of studies with detecting affect, how the students are feeling, or uh, their personality traits, and we 
the gold standard is to ask the student. <laughs> so if you wanna really find out, and we do do that in some of our tutors. We, we give them surveys before they enter something, and we do, uh, especially with the non-cognitive factors about you know, what are their personal preferences or how they're feeling, we will ask them and we will use that as part of the model. Would, would you say that it's possible that the students themselves say, this is the student model that's uh, match to me in the um, repository? Potentially, yeah. And, uh, so, uh, and getting more I I into the stuff that I was showing before where, where people are proposing, traditionally researchers have, we we've been trying to find ways that we could crowdsource both teachers and students to help improve the model too by saying, what is this, what, is, what are different about these two problems? So trying to have them, yeah, try to detect what's different and add their own way. And, and we do know, so the models that I was showing as well are very generalized to all students. And we know different students do have different skill models internally. Mm -hmm. But from the um, idea of the, the intelligent tutors, we, we have to generalize that so it works the best that it can across all students. Just so I can say one. <laughs> um, this is where the social component really comes in because some of this game playing may not be the explicit knowledge, they may not be as aware of the skills that they're developing, but this is, I think, one of the reasons they often like to play together. It's like kids will come together in the same living room and play the same video game, uh, sometimes with each other, but sometimes not, but then they talk about the strategies, and this is how I got this guy, and this is how I got, and there are lots of websites and cheat sheets and things that um, make knowledge explicit, and so it's, I think it really comes about from talking to another person that you become better able to talk to yourself. Sim. Só para terminar esse, essa questão dos videogames, eu queria perguntar para a Daphne. O que, que a gente estava comentando, que eu vi que as colegas comentaram, mais o problema da violência. A gente não poderia trabalhar com jogos de ação sem serem com violências? Não seriam os mesmos efeitos? Que eu tava, talvez a preocupação aqui seja a violência, que eu acho correta, mas o jogo de ação pode ter outro tipo de jogos que não tenha violência. Não seriam os mesmos efeitos? Entendeu? So, thanks for your question. Yes, yeah, so you're asking about whether we can build games that are action video games but are non-violent. And we can. It just happens to be the fact that in the industry, all the action video games are violent. So, with this NSF-funded project, for example, one of our goals has been to think about a game that is girl-friendly, has the action mechanics of um, the kind of action video game, but is not violent. I can give you just, it's not a scenario we used, but you, it's, it's a scenario that at one point we discussed. You could be on a new planet, animals are sick. You have a whole batteries of medication to treat them, but because they are sick, if they touch you, you're going to get weaker, and so you need to treat them from far away. And in that case, you're aiming and shooting for treating, and you're not mm -hmm. aiming and shooting for killing. And it's exactly the same mechanics, and you still have this notion of distance mm -hmm. between what you need to treat and um, where to aim. So there is like definitively a number of ways of doing this. As I said, we're doing this research. We don't know whether it's going to work, so it needs to be done. It's really an empirical question. Thank you. Oh, Is there any further addition that you want to make to this discussion? People, speakers, any? No? So, uh, so let's finish this session. Let's thank everybody, especially our speakers and our audience. <laughs>